So welcome everyone to the Sadhguru Center speaker series. This is our monthly lecture series where we have our absolutely amazing global thinkers, thought leaders, and experts share about the work that they're doing in the world, in the field, and advancing the conversation between science and spirituality in various domains. Um, we are so excited to have you all join us from all over the world. Thanks to those who shared in the chat where you're joining us from. My name is Tulsi Chase, and I'm the head of education and outreach for the Sadhguru Center. So a little bit about our center for those who, of you who are joining us for the very first time. We are a multidisciplinary research center based at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, a Harvard teaching hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, we have a, a lovely team of experts, scientists, researchers working on advancing the field of science and spirituality through our efforts in research, education, and outreach. We conduct various scientific studies uh, to understand the impacts of yoga and meditation on health and well being. And uh, all of our research publications can be found on our website. Today, we'll be having a very exciting lecture by Dr. Peter Wayne. And introducing Dr. Wayne and the topic for today is our center director, Dr. Bala Subramaniam, who is the Chair of Anesthesia, as well as a Professor of Anesthesiology at Harvard Medical School, and uh, leads our center's vision uh, forward. And thanks to all of you for being part of our community. So Dr. Bala, please do share a little bit about uh, our topic for today and our wonderful speaker. Thank you, Tulsi. And good evening, everyone. Thank you for taking your time and joining this uh, exciting session. I've always been looking forward to hearing from Peter Wayne. Peter Wayne uh, is a researcher, practitioner, and instructor of mind, body, and integrative therapies. He's a Bernard Osher Associate Professor of Medicine in the field of complementary and integrative medical therapies, Harvard Medical School, and director for the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine, jointly based at HMS and Brigham and Women's Hospital. He also founded and directs the Mind Body Movement Research Laboratory based at the Osher Center. The primary focus of Peter's current research is evaluating how complementary and integrative therapies clinically impact aging and chronic health conditions and understanding the physiological and psychological mechanisms underlying observed therapeutic effects. He has served as a principal or co-investigator on more than 30 NIH-funded studies and has been authoring a lot of research articles, almost 200 research articles peer-reviewed. Peter is also an internationally recognized teacher of Tai Chi and Qigong. He is author of Harvard Medical School Guide to Tai Chi, which received an award of excellence in medical communication by the American Medical Writers Association. It's been an absolute pressure to introduce Peter Wayne. Peter, take it away. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you. I'm gonna to try to share my screen. Yeah. Good. Well, first of all, uh, thank you, Dr. Bala, for the very kind introduction and Tulsi and others for organizing this. I'm really excited to present today um, in the spirit of building collaborations between the Sadhguru Center for a Conscious Planet and the Osher Center for Integrated Medicine. So today I'd like to share some ideas related to an ecological view of health and healing um, that extends the health-related goals of integrating mind, body, and spirit to also include concerns for planetary health. Uh, before doing so, I'm just required to disclose that in addition to doing mind-body research uh, at the medical school, I oversee a community-based Tai Chi program in the Boston area. So I'm going to begin my talk today, since it's an unusual topic, although not for this group, um, sharing my you know, personal and academic path that, that intertwines um, medicine and, and ecology and planetary health, and then talk about um, some of the opportunities and limitations in what's called reductionist thinking in medicine and why integrative or ecological thinking is also essential. I'll try to illustrate these with a couple examples from my research and others around mind-body movement for big issues for our aging society, the prevention of falls and cognitive decline, as well as the management of chronic pain. And then I will um, save some time to link this back to some of the questions we're beginning to explore at the OSHA Center around planetary health. And Tulsi uh, reminded me that this talk should be a little shorter than what I planned. So I might skip over a few things just in the spirit of, of really saving some time 
to um, have a, a, a discussion together. So my background, uh, like many people, I, I imagine, um, is not quite linear. I, I had the sense of, I grew up in a very urban environment in Brooklyn, New York, um, the, the child of, of first generation immigrants from Eastern Europe. And I grew up in the city and then I developed this passion for nature. I loved being out in the woods and wilderness and hiking and, and um, camping. Um, and that led me to a uh, career in environmental sciences, eventually a PhD in evolutionary biology of plants, where I studied um, photosynthesis, and, and that led to some interests in climate change and ecology because of the role of temperate forests in, in, in our global carbon budgets. Also led to some public health effects of looking at climate change on things like ragweed, and that was my career for about 15 plus years at the Harvard um, University Department of, of Evolutionary Biology. But while I was a teenager in high school, I also became really interested in Eastern practices, um, Eastern philosophy and martial arts, and in particular, Tai Chi. Um, this started over 45 years ago. And while I was a graduate student, I started a Tai Chi program here in the Boston area, Tai Chi School, which continues. And then at um, about the year 2000, I was offered an opportunity to change careers and start a research program at the New England School of Acupuncture, where I was teaching. So I shifted my focus and skills and interest in, in science to studying traditional East Asian healing practices. Um, one of the first things I did is I leveraged my experience at the Harvard, sort of in the Harvard space and built a bridge to the Osher Center. And we were successful in, in getting some grants that connected the acupuncture school to the Harvard Medical School. And over time, I was uh, recruited to the other side of that bridge. And uh, the last thing I would have thought uh, trained as a plant biologist is I'd be running uh, a program in medicine. Um, and lately, um, due to a lot of reasons, personal reasons and also professional reasons, I, I see that it's impossible to be thinking about our healthcare system and how we care for ourselves without this broader perspective of climate change and planetary health. So that's the sort of full arc and now one of the initiatives at the Osher Center and I'm happy to say, you know, with our partners here at the, the Saad Guru Center, is thinking about this very complex um, ecological framework for health. Okay. So I think it's fair, most of you here know that um, beginning around the 17th century or so, but especially in the past 150 years, uh, medicine has been greatly influenced by what we call reductionism. That's a way of seeing the world that believes that complex phenomena including health, can be best explained by analyzing increasingly simpler components, building blocks or mechanics of processes that are associated with a system. Reductionism has supported the evolution of what we call medical specialization in organ-based medicine, which of course, for any of us who become seriously ill and are in need of a cardiologist or an oncologist or a neurologist that spend all their time mastering what's known in that, that corner of medicine, we're very grateful for that specialization. In recent years, uh, reductionism has even drilled deeper and deeper and led to great insights at the subcellular genetic and molecular levels, leading to great breakthroughs and precision therapies for cancer, cystic fibrosis, um, and many other conditions. But it's also my guess that many people listening today also appreciate that there are costs or side effects to this reductionism or specialization in medicine, namely, the fragmentation of individuals and the way they're cared for into disconnected parts and processes with less an appreciation for the whole person. To use an ecological metaphor, reductionist medicine sometimes doesn't see the forest for the trees. At the Osher Center, integrated medicine, um, which is often typically thought about of having an acupuncturist in a pain clinic or a mind-body person in a stress clinic, it's more than just co-locating these, these therapies. It's about treating the whole person and enhancing the interconnections between the systems in an ecological way. And that's really nicely characterized in this cartoon. This is a, from a textbook on traditional East Asian medicine. On the right, you see the body as a garden or an ecosystem. And it's the goal of the healing healers and the health profession to tend to this garden, to make sure that it stays in balance. And the interconnections between these elements in the system uh, is what we believe health emerges out of. It's this complex interplay. This is a polemic, of course, but on the left, you have the sort of mechanistic, mechanical view of the body, which is a series of 
relatively autonomous replaceable parts. Obviously, you know, this is an extreme polemic here, but we're, we're leaning towards the right in integrative medicine. So Tai Chi and Qigong are by definition, yin and yang, this, this integrative approach. Um, it's um, historically, just in case people in, the, in this call are, are not familiar with these practices, um, they're mind-body exercises. They're rooted in a number of different tra Asian traditions, including the martial arts, medicine, and philosophy. They integrate slow movements with breathing and multiple cognitive skills. Um, and I'll be touching on some of these, but heightened mental focus, um, meditative states, heightened body awareness, imagery, visualization. And they use this mixture of ingredients to help strengthen, relax, and integrate the physical body and the mind, and through that improve health, personal development, self-awareness, and self-defense. I think you can replace this with yoga and many of the other traditions from these other wisdom cultures. And you'll see lots of parallels in what I present today. This cartoon gives you an idea of the multimodal ecological nature of these practices. Um, unlike a single drug, which has like a single active ingredient that targets a single receptor and affects change from there, these are like multiple drug interventions. And so you see, this, these are some of the, the, the core components of what underlie Tai Chi Qigong. But again, you could put yoga and many other things in the middle here. But we've got physical exercise. You know, you're doing weight bearing, strengthening, flexibility. So there's the component of health promotion um, through physical activity. We don't care just about the pieces, but how they fit together, the biomechanics, the structural integration, the, the, the postural dynamics. Um, you'll hear lots about um, active relaxation of the mind and the body, um, paying attention, these cognitive skills. You could think in some ways of this as mindfulness on wheels. It's, it's integrated into um, a complex set of, of physical activities. Belief, uh, we, each of these have been studied quite extensively in separation and not necessarily in the context of Qigong or Tai Chi, but we know from great placebo research that happens at, uh, across the Harvard Medical School led by Ted Kaptik and others, that what we believe, our intention, our expectation, greatly influence as physiological and clinical outcomes. And it's built into these um, traditional practices to really rely on imagery and visualization quite a bit. Breathing is really important, of course. Many of these things happen in the context of social interactions. And there's philosophy built in. Maybe, maybe more is not more. Maybe just backing off a little bit and trying a little less will be more effective. Go with the flow. So you get the idea. There's a very complex intervention with lots of therapeutic components. And here I just list, I'll be talking a little bit about falls, but on the right here are a list of risk factors that we know are associated with falls. And what you see here is, and, and each of these on the right have been substantiated with clinical trials, good randomized controlled clinical trials of Tai Chi, but Tai Chi reduces um, um, the risk of weak muscles or sarcopenia, um, it enhances proprioception, plantar sensation in the soles of the feet, uh, touch sensitivity, which is important to balance. Reflexes, you know, they put people on treadmills and they can stop and start them when they're safe in a harness. And we see that people who practice Tai Chi um, not only respond quicker to those perturbations, but in a more efficient way. Um, you'll see later that um, one of the biggest predictors of falls is being fearful of falling. Um, and, and how people carry themselves and the emotional relaxation of Tai Chi, the, the body awareness seems to um, offset that limitation. And it goes on. Pain, for example, is a predictor of falls and Tai Chi has very good effects on pain. And I'll share some of that as well. The main point here, maybe from this whole talk, uh, this first half of the talk, is that this is very different than a drug targeting a single site. This is multiple therapeutic ingredients affecting multiple systems in the body and changing health in a very ecological way. And I think that this is a very different non-pharmacological approach that um, is underutilized and is really important in our society today. Okay? And you can already see that being an ecologist has really changed um, how I think about medicine. Remember our first study with heart failure, they said, okay, so maybe you are changing heart failure, but what's the active ingredient? in Tai Chi. And as an ecologist, I stood back and I said, we only get to pick one. And so this was what made, led me to, to drawing this cartoon. So I want to talk a little more specifically about 
um, it, how this ecology plays out in two really important issues for our aging society, um, balance and cognition. Okay. Um, as many of you know, um, these are huge public health issues in our booming, aging boomer society. About one third of the adults over 65 years of age fall every year. Uh, fatal falls, you know, death related to falls exceeds opioid deaths by a factor of four. Um, the costs associated with caring for people um, with uh, morbidity and uh, is just phenomenal and it's growing. It's about 55 million in recent, a billion in recent years. And because this, our society is aging, these costs are going up. And the impact of cognitive decline in, in older adults is even more alarming. Um, there's estimated over 10 million people over the age of 65 with mild cognitive impairment, early stages of dementia, uh, and an additional over 6 million that have full-blown uh, dementia like Alzheimer's. Um, and the costs for caring for, for, for these people um, is alarming. And there are no good drugs on the market to say, oh, we're going to take this drug to prevent the fall, and we're going to take this drug to prevent dementia. As much as we're trying, especially for the latter, there's just very little traction there. So we need to reach out for these other tools. The traditional approaches to dealing with falls and, and cognition have been very unintegrated. Okay? So if you have some limitations with your, your physical balance, you may go to a physical therapist or a physiatrist and they can suggest some bottom-up training, strength, flexibility, agility, maybe a little stamina. And if you're having some trouble with the memory, they'll think, oh, we really need to work on your brain. Um, some cognitive training, do some puzzles, learn a language, those sorts of things. Um, and as I said, there's not much pharmacotherapy out there. But what we know now is that things as simple as walking, which obviously healthy walking prevents falls, um, require both top-down and bottom-up processes. And there's a real large literature out there that suggests this, basically that how you think affects how you move and how you move affects how you think. And to separate those is reductionistic and you're, you're not seeing the forest for the trees or taking advantage of the way people have evolved. Okay, so I wanna just unpack that a little bit. This interdependence of, of cognitive decline, um, uh, of cognition and motor function is really challenged um, how we're thinking about training people now. Um, Initially, maybe you do exercises for one, as I said, and Sudoku, but maybe you should be doing Sudoku puzzles while you're on a treadmill. Can you combine cognitive motor? And in fact, people are doing these sorts of things. Um, you can see here, this elderly gentleman is probably doing some balance and strength training while he's doing some cognitive tasks. There's gamification. Some of you um, who have children or you yourself remember playing Dance Dance Revolution. You've got these movement patterns with cognitive uh, challenges and those train both systems in an integrated way. There's virtual reality where people can walk through complex environments and practice their walking, their mobility while they're uh, being challenged cognitively. And what I want to say is that some of these practices like Tai Chi and Qigong are old school integrated approaches. It's built in that the assumption is mind and body are connected. Let's train them together. So I wanted to say a few things about what we know um, from Tai Chi research around fall prevention, uh, preservation of cognitive function, and in particular, that ecological dance between um, uh, cognitive motor interactions during what we call a dual task, a way we can bring this into the laboratory and test it objectively. This is just an example of, uh, of a recent study. It's one of the better ones. It's by Fujian Lee's group in Oregon, um, published in a very high quality journal, the Journal of American Medical Association. It's a three-arm randomized trial in older adults. Um, one group received Tai Chi Chuan um, for Tai Chi for um, six months of training with an additional six months follow-up. Another group, the uh, control group, received multimodal exercise, including aerobics, resistance training, things like that, but not the mind-body training of Tai Chi. And a third group did stretching, um, but they were seated. So it sort of controls for things. So it's a very rigorous design where you can ask, is these, are these mind-body practices offering something unique from just physical exercise or seat, seated um, expectation of getting better? Yeah. And the results were really striking. After six months, um, Tai Chi versus re stretching resulted in a 58% reduction in falls 
and even Tai Chi compared to multimodal exercise um, resulted in a 31% reduction in falls. What was even more striking um, is after 12 months, six months following the training, um, the um, effects of Tai Chi uh, versus stretching on injurious falls was dramatic. 75% reduction in injurious falls. And those are the ones that lead to hospitalization and high cost of society. So I would say I'm a fairly conservative person. Um, there's a lot of trials out there. There's really good evidence that Tai Chi is one of the best tools out there for maintaining balance and mobility. Okay. The, the evidence on Tai Chi and cognitive function is um, promising and growing. There aren't as definitive trials out there yet. We surveyed the trials a number of years ago and found 11 randomized trials. Um, and in particular, we saw some nice improvements in executive function. I'll come back to that in a little while because that's really important uh, piece of the mind-body shift, the, the multitasking. Um, this is just an example of a, of a nice study done in Asia. It's a little dated, but 120 people who uh, were um, average age of 68, they were all cognitively intact. This is the mini mental um, state exam for cognition. And they were divided into four groups randomly, Tai Chi, walking, social interactions, and nothing. Um, it's nice because it's a long intervention, 40 weeks. It's very hard to do these trials. Um, because it's not just giving people pills and just say take one a day, but they have to go to classes and practice and things like that. So these are challenging interventions, behavioral interventions. And what they found in this uh, study, which has been found in other studies as well, is after 40 weeks, this is a, a, a dementia index, a, a composite index of various aspects of cognitive function. Tai Chi improved far more than any of the other groups. Executive function, this is the trail making test. Um, your ability to shift from letters to numbers and follow, uh, draw lines to connect them. The lower your score, the faster you complete that. So again, Tai Chi is doing better than these other interventions. And this was interesting. And part of the reason I showed this is that they had the wherewithal to measure total brain volume. Um, and surprisingly, even after um, 40 weeks or so, um, there were changes, morphological changes in the brain in relation to Tai Chi. Um, there's a growing body of literature um, that I won't go into right now that substantiates that these cognitive effects um, have a neural basis um, through either uh, neural networks using fMRI or structural changes or looking at um, um, neurotransmitters uh, and brain-derived neurotropic factors and things like that. So again, it's a, it's a growing field, but something about this mind-body combination is changing the nervous system and falls and cognition. So there's some promise here for our aging society. So I wanna just share a little bit how we bring people into the lab and look at this literal mind-body connection, this cognitive motor connection. And one way we do that is what we call dual task. If I were to ask you guys to stand on one leg, um, you could probably do pretty well, most of you. Most of you, if I asked you to do that and at the same time count backwards by six and a half, your attention would go to, that's a really odd question, and all of a sudden you're not paying attention to your body. And it's very quickly it becomes obvious that you need your attention, not just physical strength, to maintain your balance. And so this is what's called a dual task, in this case a dual cognitive task. And most of the challenges um, that lead, lead people to fall are out in the real world where they're distracted. You're walking down an aisle at a supermarket and you're looking at a list, it's horrible if you read the literature of all the accidents that happen, people looking at their phone and they walk up a train platform. But we need to pay attention to move around physically in the world. So we can test that. This is um, an example of a woman coming into one of our studies. She's in her um, late 70s, I believe. And on the top panel, she's walking quietly. In other words, she's just asked to walk at a normal speed. The same on the bottom, except she's counting backwards by threes. And you can see two things here. One. Um, this is in real time. She walks much faster when she's not distracted. And we know that walking speed predicts all sorts of things, falls, cognitive decline, um, all cause mortality in older people. And But also look at the spacing between her steps. The top is much more regular. There's a, an irregularity in the rhythmicity of, and placement of her steps. And that stride time variability, as it's called, is also highly predictive of falls and neurological decline. 
Okay. And so our question is, if we teach this woman Tai Chi, will she walk while counting more similar to the top panel after learning Tai Chi than before it? In other words, can we get that cognitive motor piece to move back and forth because of all the mind-body training that's implicit in Tai Chi? And the short answer is yes. This is a study by what was once a postdoc. Now he's an associate professor here at, at Harvard called Brad Manor. Um, this is not a group of spring chickens. The average age was about 86 years old. We had a couple people who turned 100 during the start of this study. Um, and what you can see is their walking speed from baseline to 12 months improved significantly while they were doing a dual, dual task in the Tai Chi group, but not in the education control group. Um, this is a measure of variability. So remember, more variability is bad. And we brought in some Tai Chi experts from the Boston area and we compared them to very healthy Tai Chi naive adults, all aged 50 to 80. Um, and what we see is that the, when we ask people to walk while they're doing a co complex mental task, the variability in their strides is much lower after long-term Tai Chi training. And we also saw that we took the naive group of 60 people, randomized them, and they started moving in this direction. Okay? We've also done this in Parkinson's disease. Um, Parkinson's is really important because as you lose dopamine, that automatic nature of your walking um, gets deteriorated. And But we believe you can preserve high quality walking by recruiting places um, that uh, control executive functioning. And there's been some studies, neuroimaging studies on that. And what we see here is that Tai Chi improves of that variability in walking in Parkinson's um, which deteriorates quite a bit. In fact, freezing of gait, that stuttering of stepping is an extreme uh, source of stride time variability. So it seems to be helping with that mind-body connection, literally. I just wanna say a few things about pain. Um, and this is such a huge issue for our society. Um, you know, it, it, I think the number of older adults with pain over 65 is, is close to 50, 60% people suffer with chronic pain. And we know with the opioid epidemic that we need some other approaches. But we're also learning that pain is not just a mechanical thing, but has a huge cognitive and emotional piece. And again, it opens the door for these traditional practices that are more ecological in terms of mind, body, and, and attention. And I'll just briefly mention two examples. Uh, one study is a really nice study from Australia that's a little dated now. Amanda Hall did a first study showing that Tai Chi training for 12 weeks reduces both the bothersomeness of back pain as well as back pain disability by about 30%. What was cool is in her second paper, um, she had the wherewithal to look at cognitive structures. And one of them is catastrophizing. And uh, many of you probably are familiar with this, um, may not know the term, but it, it's your worry ward. Oh, my back is going out. I'm not gonna be able to go to work, play with my grandchildren. and. Maybe, you know, if that goes on for a couple of weeks, I'll be homeless. Um, it just, you just start to ruminate and it gets out of control. Your, 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 your mind takes over. And that's where meditation is beautiful because it brings you back into the moment and you question those thoughts. But what they found in this study, which I find fascinating is, yes, we would expect Tai Chi to help, but maybe more through stretching and posture. But two thirds of the effects of Tai Chi on back pain related disability had to do with mental processes of reducing catastrophizing and being in the present and not worrying. And only one third had to do with other factors. And one third of, of the effects um, on pain intensity were due to these catastrophizing and rumin rumination processes. So the mind is playing a really important role here. And I just wanna just uh, share one study um, that uh, it's a small study, but an important study that we did a few years ago. Um, and it was in women with persistent post-surgical pain. It's a horrible um, um, condition in breast cancer survivors. Not only do they have the trauma of being diagnosed with cancer, not only do they survive the invasive treatments um, and all the side effects of chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery, but approximately 40% of the women come out the other end with chronic pain. And that chronic pain holds them in this story. Is this the cancer coming back? Um, it just reminds them. And so it's a multi-component pain. And we thought, let's see if we can penetrate that and shift the ecology of that with a mind-body Qigong system. Um, so we taught them in a group. So they had psychosocial support, um, Badwajin, 
as a form of Qigong for 12 weeks. And basically, we change the dial in a lot of different components of their ecology. We reduce their pain. We reduce the amount of interference that they describe that pain having. Um, we reduce their anxiety. We induce their, uh, reduce their depression. We were interested in whether this mindful movement made them more aware of their body. And there's a lovely measure of interoceptive awareness called the multi-dimensional assessment of interoceptive awareness called Maya, developed by Wolf Mayling. Um, and it's a wonderful instrument. And it asks these questions, for example, in body trusting, um, you endorse this. When I'm upset, I take time to explore how my body feels. And after doing this training, people endorse that more that they're drawn into their body. When something's not right, they're curious. Um, uh, and then trust, uh, you know, simple questions like, I feel my, like my body's a safe place. And after doing this training, they felt like their body was a safe place. This is really changing the mind-body ecology. Their words were remarkable. We did some qualitative work. We have an anthropologist on our team. I'll just read one of the quotes around this mind-body connection that they shared. How you feel about your body is a challenge after you've had breast cancer. But mind and body have to be interconnected. All of it together in Qigong mind-body exercise. It relaxes you and helps you stretch out a little bit, calm you down, help you think about your body in a different way, and to trust your body, to get inside yourself in a different way. It doesn't mean you're not going to get cancer again, but it could mean that you're more at peace with your body. And I think that that, that just captures the richness of these ecological interventions. And finally, um, you know, we can bring people into the laboratory. Uh, this is an example of a person um, in a very sophisticated biomechanics laboratory. Each one of those dots on this moving um, diagram is an infrared sensor with cameras all around the room, and we can calculate very specific angles. And what we're interested in is what's the relationship between body shape and affect. And we know that um, these women, you know, they've been gone through tremendous kinds of trauma and through often bilateral mastectomies have changes in the self-image and shame around that. And we were curious about how standing differently, doing Qigong, being in a group would change that. And what we found essentially in brief was that those women who had the biggest changes in the carriage of the head and shoulders, that slump feeling more to an upright position, also had the greatest improvements in anxiety and depression. Okay, and the point that we want to make here is not that changing your shape changes your mood or changing your mood changes your shape, but it's silly to think of these in reductionist separate ways, that these are coordinated parts of the mind-body system. Um, if you don't believe me, this is one of the, my favorite quotes. It's the very first phrase in this landmark book to, in the West, Zen Mind, Beginner Mind by um, Suzuki. And the first one is about how to sit. And he says, the forms, the postures you take are not a means of obtaining the right state of mind. To take this posture itself is to have the right state of mind. The implicit in these practices is that mind and body are interconnected. And if you don't believe that, then there's really strong evidence from peanuts. And this is Charlie Brown saying, this is my depressed stance. When you're depressed, it makes a lot of difference how you stand. The worst thing you can do is straighten up and hold your head high because then you start to feel better. If you're going to get any joy out of being depressed, you got to stand like this. Okay, so even he knew. Okay, all right. So I'm going to just shift gears here, see where I'm with time, and um, and just touch on these issues that I think are are key to both of our centers. But as I said before, I, I've come to the conclusion that we can't be thinking of ourselves on the pillow or in the Tai Chi studio without thinking about the world around us that sustains us and and that we should be stewards for. Um, there's great literature out there that climate change is one of the biggest health issues out there. Um, it's affecting us in so many ways in terms of extreme events and uh, climate change refugees and you know, people being killed by extreme events and then homeless and it's, it's just horrible. Um, all sorts of impacts of heat and drought and, and pathogens affecting health, et cetera. And so I won't go into that. that that's like a whole set of talks in themselves. Um, we put out a little paper um, when we started to, to say, let's take this on, that integrative medicine could be a good prescription for both people and the planet. And I'm going to just suggest a couple ways where this connection is really obvious. One of them is hospitals. Um, if you rank countries in the world um, in terms of their greenhouse emissions, Korea's 12th, 
United Kingdom is 14th. The US healthcare system is 13th. We generate so much pollution in our hospitals. So can, we can keep people out of hospitals, maybe not what our CFOs in hospitals wanna hear, but that this is good for the people and it's good for the planet. Um, to um, the credit of our hospitals, especially the Harvard ones, there's a lot of really good initiatives going on, on right now in terms of the greening of hospitals. I won't say much about that, but that's an important um, intermediate step. But prevention is really important. Um, in Chinese medicine, it's a quote from the Yellow Emperor going way back. To fight a disease after it's occurred is like trying to dig a well when one is thirsty or forging for a weapon once a war has begun. We want to work upstream. We want to be more of the gardener in that image in the beginning of the talk of tending to the garden before the weeds take over and really sustaining health and preventing illness and, and or minimizing its, its impact. And I've already talked about Tai Chi and other ways that we can keep people out of the hospital with falls. Diets are a really good one. This is you know, a famous pre, uh, PREDIMED study um, and uh, looking at Mediterranean diets and uh, you know, eating well reduces the risks of cardiovascular events. It's, it's well known. It's hard to do, but it's well known. Um, and so it's good for us. And we also know that eating more of a Mediterranean diet um, has different impacts on food systems. So thinking about diet, and this is such a complicated piece. We just, I was just at a conference at the Nova Institute and processed foods are a really big problem. It's not just whether you eat uh, vegetarian or meat or whether you're vegan or not. Um, processing foods is really important. How, how foods are uh, agriculturally raised and transportation, where your food comes from. These are some of the hugest things. So, but there's lots of ways of thinking about sustaining your own health and thinking about the health of, of the environment. And I know that's a big part of Sadhguru's um, initiatives as well with soil. This is just a very simple, obvious thing. Um, taking care of yourself with exercise. Um, this is a beautiful modeling study done in the Midwest. Um, and they, they, they said, said, let's do this thought experiment. Um, if we can get people who use their car for just a short trip, like, you know, five, six blocks away um, for every other time to just walk or ride a bike, what would the impact be? But they modeled it in two ways. They modeled it in terms of the pollution that starting a cold car and driving at a short distance would generate all of these um, particulates and ozone and things like that, which then result in asthma and all sorts of things that can be modeled. But then they said, what if people are biking and walking that improves their cardiovascular health, their mental state, and that'll reduce costs um, in terms of medical costs on society. And what they said, if you combine the two of these, um, just shifting every other short trip to using walking or biking in this one region in the Midwest would save $8 billion in medical costs. Um, but it's, it's interesting that these people think of this in an integrative way. What's the impact on the environment? What's the impact on health? And how do the two integrate together? So integrative thinking and planetary health. One that I wanna end with is obvious, I think, to a lot of contemplative practices. We, we have growing evidence. We all kind of feel it after we done a good practice. We're nicer people. We're nice to ourselves, we're nicer to each other. But there's a growing body of data that suggests that mindfulness practices, contemplative meditation, um, makes people more pro-social, more emp empathic to each other. Beautiful, quick study by Gail DeBoard. Um, she used to be at Harvard. Uh, she went to Mind and Life. Um, but she said, if I teach people meditation, will they be kinder? And basically, the way she set this up was for the follow-up visit of neuroimaging, people sat um, in, in a waiting room. And these were all sort of actors in a play. And a person with a disability comes in, and there are no seats. And she wanted to know if after teaching people meditation, will they get up faster to give that seat to the disabled person? Um, and so what she found was, yes, indeed, meditation makes people nicer and you can quantify it in terms of seconds. But there's a growing evidence out there that this is the case. There's also some evidence out there that doing mindfulness practices changes your empathic relationship to nature. And I had the privilege as an evolutionary biologist of being a student of E.O. Wilson, um, uh, and um, teaching in his fellows course. And he was just a remarkable man that's just done so much for us to create an appreciation for nature and to create an evolutionary framework for thinking about why we're part of nature and we should feel this way and how we can cultivate that. 
And so there's some literature on that. And I'll just end with this quote here, um, which is from a really lovely Tai Chi study um, by Yang Yang. And these are Midwest women in their 70s that go to church on Sunday. They are not predisposed Eastern spiritual people. But she wrote, Tai Chi gives us a way to create a spiritual moment that's also very helpful. I'm more aware of my spirituality. I never would have thought that, you know, when you're out there doing your meditation and you look out there and you see these beautiful trees and you know that's God's energy. It's going to be part of me. Like when we do this Qigong thing where your hands come over your head and you call washing yourself with Qi, you wash your organs and gather that nature energy with our hands. That's God's energy washing through me. It's some, it offers this opportunity for connecting myself to a spirit within that's part of something um, much larger. So through the practice of integrating yourself, there's some dissolving of the boundary of self and others or self and nature. And that porosity, I think, is really one of the key areas where we can link spirituality and planetary health, where it's good for ourselves and hopefully good for the planet. So um, we have a couple initiatives going on at the Osher Center about developing ways where we can teach people mind-body practices that care for themselves, but also cultivate this pro-social and pro-environmental behavior. And I'm happy to talk about that. Our conclusion of all of this is um, taking the slogan, think globally and act locally to act extremely locally, meaning contemplate your navel. So thank you. Thank you for listening. And I think I saved some good time. <laughs> Peter, thank you so much. This is so um, amazing body of work and thanks for all that you have done. Um, I let others ask, but I just have one question before I let you go is, can you talk briefly about the effect of Tai Chi on the human brain itself, either connectivity or the areas they engage in? Like uh, what are the areas they affect control, et cetera? Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm not a cognitive neuroscientist. And it just depends on the populations that have been studied. So, um, you know, like in meditation, the default mode network is influenced, the dorsal attention network, sustained attention, um, the prefrontal cortex in terms of executive function. Um, but there's very complex networks that, that we're discovering. And I think with, you know, different neural network analyses and AI, we're starting to see these, these um, things light up and, and fire together. And, but as I mentioned briefly, um, some of these uh, neural data are correlated with clinical outcomes. And so um, the improved executive function does map out to attention networks and default mode networks and things like that. And even we've done some studies where we can look at gait variability and gait speed changes and gait variability changes are linked to different neural networks. Um, your ability to walk healthily while you're dual tasking is very different than just your ability to walk quickly. Um, Thank you, Peter. I, I think Tilak is there. Who's uh, Tilak? Can you ask your question directly, Mr. Fox? Yeah, hi. Uh, that was a great talk, Dr. Wayne. Thank you very uh, much. Thank you. Uh, you know, so uh, while I'm walking around in the evening, I see in the park uh, some people uh, doing Tai Chi, but not very frequently. The local library offers some sessions always at an inconvenient hour if you're working. So my question to you is, what is the overall availability of Tai Chi in the community? Uh, I was just uh, looking at your center in Jamaica Plain. Uh, it seems you offer some sessions by Zoom. So how long is the training program? And thereafter, you know, after you've been initiated, if that's the right word, uh, do you just do it at home alone or is it better in a group session in the park, which is what I see outdoors? So uh, yeah. if you could just comment on those. Thank you so much. Yeah, a couple of things in there. Um, thank you for the question. You know, one of the things we're trying to do is the evidence for Tai Chi is quite good. The implementation and the scalability is not. If you look at the growth of yoga over the last 10 years, it's grown 10, 15% in the medical community. It's only grown 1% in the Tai Chi community. We don't know what it is. We think maybe we need to market, you know, fancy clothes a little better to attract people to the practice. But you're right. The, the access to this is not as great as things like yoga and other practices. It also depends on where you are. Metropolitan areas are better than others. And COVID has really closed a lot of public centers that haven't fully reopened 
with that, people have moved to virtual. And so there's quite a bit available virtually now. Um, and uh, But they're in the Boston area, there's probably a good 10, 15 Tai Chi schools that are offering things uh, increasingly in person. Um, I think that it, I've been at it for 45 years and I continue to study with many people. Um, I feel like a beginner and I, I say that very, Honestly, um, it's just these practices are lifelong learning and you just keep learning. So to be in groups where you can practice with each other, you can get feedback from your teacher um, and refine things, it's really nice to stay connected. Um, but it also depends on what you wanna get out of it. If you, you know, um, you can learn a regimen that, that you can complement your walking and other exercise and meditation with and that could be just fine and you have a practice you really love. And if you keep doing it, it'll reveal itself if you're listening carefully and, and letting it teach you. Um, but I think that the, both the contact with um, feedback, but also the community of support um, is really important. I mean, sanghas are important in Eastern traditions, uh, churches. It's just people get together and reinforce their commitment to things and there's there's an emergence that happens you know one tree in the forest doesn't create humidity but a bunch of them together create an environment that's bigger than the sum of the parts so i think in those groups you, you feel something a little different thank you yeah thank you so much uh, dr wayne for sharing these resources and sharing this amazing uh, topic with us and i think we're all many of us from this call are now going to go and seek out tai chi in our local communities um we do have a few more questions in the chat actually if i can yes. invite kerry hannigan to uh, unmute and please share your question hi sure thank you yes i'm i'm definitely going to go look into the community options <laughs> Um, I was wondering how you recommend patients who are struggling with the reductionist, you know, healthcare system and just kind of seeing specialist to specialist, how you move to something more integrative. Yeah, so at our Osher clinic, so the Osher Center, like um, your center, uh, like uh, Dr. Bala Center, has clinical components, research and education. So we have a clinic embedded in the um, Brigham and Women's Hospital. And we have uh, really wise doctors that listen. And uh, we have an integrative team. Um, they sort of are interested in the whole person. They're less interested in what's the matter with you. Um, they, they obviously care about that, but they're more interested in what matters to you and what, what's important, what do you wanna do? And how can the therapies that we offer, um, whether they're psychological or exercise-based or nutrition, or manual therapies, acupuncture, chiropractic, those sorts of things. Um, how can they help you achieve your goals? That, that's their goal. Um, so um, passing people on to those things, and, but also educating them. Like in this talk, um, you realize, oh, my balance is not just how strong my legs are, but whether my head's in the gutter, as we would say in Brooklyn, where I grew up, or in the clouds, or whether you're being present. Um, uh, that pain has an affective piece to it, and that being anxious and and um, probably contributes to pain um, and worrying. Um, so, you know, just appreciating these interconnections makes people a little bit more open to pursuing those and, and receiving those therapies at a deeper level. Um, but passing people on to professionals, there are, there are people who specialize in this. I, I hope that answers your question as a start. Thank you. Yeah, no, I will definitely look into the Osher Center. Yes, the Osher Center, but there are many places, you know, um, uh, across Harvard. Part of what the Osher Center has done is to try to create um, a center without walls that makes each center aware of the other ones. When we started, you know, there's the Benson Henry Mind Body Institute, the Zakem Center for Integrative Therapies um, for Cancer at Dana Farber, there's integrative programs at Spalding and McLean's and BI. And most of these centers were unaware of each other. And so part of our meta integration is just to create, help create community. And you can go to our website at the Osher Center and you can see maps um, of all these clinical resources now um, and all the integrative therapists that are affiliated with Harvard hospitals, as well as researchers um, across the network. Thank you, I appreciate it. 
Thank you, Dr. Wayne. I think we have time for just a couple more uh, questions here. Uh, I believe Akila has a question for you as well. Hi, Dr. Wayne. Thank you so much for your talk. That was super, super interesting. Um, I feel like this whole concept of taking mindfulness and using it to combat climate change is a topic that I've been really interested in recently. So um, I'm so glad that you brought that up and connected it back to planetary health and all of that. Um, I was curious to know your opinion on how what the next step is. Like, how do you bring this knowledge that is starting to be created about how um, important mindfulness and mental health can be in terms of combating climate change and, you know, connecting to the planet and all of that. Like, how do you take it to the next step? How do you bring it to the larger scale so that there is an impact there? Yeah, it's such a great question. And um, I think, I don't think it's any one approach. I think, um, I think caring for ourselves, you know, one of the messages I wanted to make is that when we feel bad, you know, in, in where I grew up in Brooklyn, you know, the joke, you know, was, you know, when the going gets tough, the tough go shopping. Um, and, uh, you know, my sister would go to the mall, you know, to ease anxiety or buy things. You think about that as a tool for managing your, your, your mental health and the impact that has on climate change in terms of just buying stuff, shipping things, stuff like that. So there are ways of changing our individual health and the health you know, how people care for themselves, that could scale up. I think we need to work at the hospital level. You know, these are, you know, reading of hospitals, but policy is really important. Um, one of the initiatives at many medical schools now um, or academic centers is training physicians um, who and nurses and, and allied health providers to be ambassadors to this message. Because if they can tell their patients you know, this is happening, you need to drink more water, you need to protect your skin more, then this consciousness that this is not just something you read about in the news, but will affect you and your children and your children's children um, is really important. So developing educational programs that train the healthcare providers to be aware of this. Um, and what we're trying to develop our resilience programs, for example, teaching people mind-body practices out in nature, so while they're learning tools to care for themselves, protect against burnout, um, to protect against eco-anxiety and things like that, they're also learning about nature and they become our ambassadors. Um, and uh, we think that doing this in nature um, is really important. Like that quote at the end, you, people start to realize, oh, where I end and the rest of the world begins is not so clear that this is all connected. And so, uh, we're developing multimodal programs that teach about planetary health while people are learning about their own inner ecology. But it's it's going to take everybody, and policy is a really big one. Um, I'm not too qualified to talk about that. Thank you. Yeah. But there are a lot of organizations out there that are really working hard towards this, and there's a Planetary Health Alliance based at the, the Harvard School of Public Health here. Um, there's the NOVA Institute for the health of people, places, and planet, the Sadhguru Center, just all sorts of things. So I, I, I'm optimistic. Um, I tend to be an optimist. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wayne. I, I'm so excited that we're all, you know, on this journey together. And the more people on this journey, the better. Uh, we have a couple more questions in the chat, which I'll read out to you. Uh, Mary A asks, are there resources for learning about Tai Chi's impacts on accident recovery? If you could share a little bit on that, please. Yeah, you know, it's a great question. Um, uh, as I mentioned, there's some work on managing chronic pain, back pain, neck pain, osteoarthritis of the knee, um, those sorts of things. Uh, in terms of rehabilitation, not specifically yet, but I think that um, those are hard studies to do. Um, but I, I believe, I can't imagine that. So there is some work in terms of stroke rehabilitation. There's some work in managing Parkinson's symptoms. So yeah, there is some data in there. But in terms of like someone falls and has a fracture, will this get them back on their feet faster? Um, that data hasn't uh, been generated yet, but I can't imagine it doesn't help. Um, Thank you. Yeah, maybe some areas for future studies as well, right?
Yeah. yeah. And then uh, one more question from Hardeep Singh says, in one of the papers, you compared Tai Chi with cardio, a cardio group, wondering about different test groups there. You could maybe share a little bit more on that. Yeah, um, I don't remember the exact slide, but I can tell you that um, one area of our portfolio, which I believe Dr. Gloria Ye has already spoken in your group in the past. Um, she's been my partner in Tai Chi research for many years, or, or I, her, uh, her partner, but her area is around cardiopulmonary things. And so we've done a number of studies in heart failure um, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Sometimes our control groups are educational groups, but we have done one small study where we compared Tai Chi to aerobic exercise. Other studies have compared Tai Chi to brisk walking. And surprisingly, even though your heart rate gets pumped up much more doing brisk walking or aerobics, the impact on um, stamina and your ability to, to do exercise testing in the lab or your six minute walk um, is, is preserved quite well with Tai Chi. So there's something else going on besides just pumping your heart to make you quote unquote cardiovascularly healthy. Um, intriguing and we're exploring that some, some further, um, but yeah. But control groups are really important because they each control group answers a different question. Thank you. Thank you for answering the questions. And, you know, people can feel free to share further questions. Maybe uh, if uh, Dr. Wayne, if you have a way that uh, you'd be open to people contacting you, uh, maybe you can share that in the chat. But I wanted to just say thank you so much for taking the time to uh, share about this important topic with us today. It's been such a pleasure to hear from you and to learn about this topic. And there's clearly a lot of interest, a growing interest in this. So um, I wanted to just say thank you from our center and from our community for sharing us your sharing with us your evening and time today. And thank you to all of you who have joined us as well from all over the globe. <laughs> So I want to say thank you for this opportunity and I'm excited to work with Dr. Bala and you and others to explore synergies. Um, I think there's so much to do and I think doing it together uh, makes sense. And I'm easy to find um, just Peter Wayne, P. Wayne at bwh.harvard.edu. Um, if you type in Peter Wayne, Tai Chi, Harvard, not many other people will come up. <laughs> and I can point you also to some community-based programs. Um, in Tai Chi for people who want to learn either virtually or in person in the Boston area. So thank you again, and I appreciate everyone taking time and really enjoyed the questions. Thank Thanks you so much. So Peter. much. Um, and then for those of you who are, you know, wanting to hear more about this kind of a topic where we're connecting, uh, you know, integrative health, specific contemplative practices, and, you know, how it affects planetary health as well. Please stay tuned for our future speaker series. Our upcoming event in April is uh, actually going to be on lifestyle medicine. So touching upon many of the aspects that Dr. Wayne talked about towards the end of uh, the talk, you know, bringing in diet and stress resilience and different aspects of lifestyle and how these can be integrated into a more uh, whole picture of health and specifically looking at how it can enhance leadership. Uh, joining us to talk on this topic will be uh, Dr. Elizabeth Pegg Frates, who is the president of American College of Lifestyle Medicine. This talk is available uh, both uh, on Zoom and in person. Uh, and to learn more about this event, you can use the QR code on the bottom left here and uh, sign up as soon as we send out information about it through our mailing list. So if you're not already on our mailing list, I highly suggest uh, you join us there and so you can be the first to learn about events like this. Um, also, for those of you who are learning more about the Sadhguru Center uh, through our online events like this, we wanted to share we have a whole host of wonderful wellness programs for various clinical populations, including for long COVID, for cancer survivors, for Parkinson's disease, one that's specifically focusing on mental health, and we offer personalized wellness programs to the community as well at our location in Brookline, Massachusetts. So these are different uh, opportunities to share also with members of your community, whether they're local or residing anywhere. And then uh, just a reminder for those of you who are joining us for the first time and would like to stay in touch 
You can certainly subscribe here to join our newsletter and be the first to hear any updates on upcoming events, programs that you can participate in, and uh, research highlights and exciting publications that have been launched by our center and collaborators as well. Uh, we're very excited to be announcing that we will be hosting Harvard's very first consciousness conference uh, in October this year, October 26th and 27th, right here in Boston. And we'll be joined by some very well-known speakers from around the planet, including Sadhguru, Steven Pinker, Helen Langevin, and Susan Bauer Wu. So we hope that you will be here in person joining us for this very, very exciting melding of minds, of great minds, and uh, to really explore what consciousness is and how it impacts and is impacted by science, spirituality, and uh, the social world. So we're uh, really excited to have you join us for that. And finally, please stay in touch with us on social media. Uh, you can follow our director, Dr. Bala, on Twitter as well as on LinkedIn using these handles and uh, be amongst the first to know about any exciting news. And you can also reach out to us and connect to us like this. And finally, if you have any further ideas, questions, feedback, um, and would like to connect with us, you can always reach us via email at sadgurucenter at didmc.harvard.edu. Thank you again to everyone for joining us. We hope you have a lovely rest of your day. Uh, and maybe you'll be adding Tai Chi to your new routine soon. <laughs> Please stay in touch and let us know how it goes. All right. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.